Um, with what the information we're trying to disseminate today, uh, the hands-on is, is really the most valuable, where you actually get to touch and feel and look at all of the components. But we want to give you some of this information before we get into that. So when I look at this, the question comes to mind is, you know, what makes up a beautiful smile? Ultimately, that's what we want to do. So we know that it's the lips that forms the, the framework of the smile. And then we've got the teeth. Yes, that's obvious. That's we, what we're working with. But the tooth looks good when it's got a nice arch form of gum around it with sufficient gum volume. And that uh, has a lot to do with the surgical aspects. But it's at this point where we are restoring it as restorative dentists that we have a lot of influence on what the soft tissue looks like. So it's the, the fine detail and the uh, fine tuning to be able to bring the case together. All right. The case here being a single implant restoration. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that just now. But since Ridwan ended up mentioning uh, the multi units towards the end of his lecture, I thought I'd bring that a little bit forward. And we're going to talk about that first. Right. So I've called this little talk the multiple benefits of multi unit abutments. So in his lecture, he's shown you already what a multi-unit looks like. He's alluded to the fact that a multi-unit can carry a single restoration if it's got that little nut on the top, right? the anti-rotational feature. But traditionally, a multi-unit restoration was there to carry any restoration that had more than one implant integrated into it and more than one tooth supported, uh, implant supported crown. Um, and it's a very important tool, it's a very important com component for us to understand because it has the potential of making our work easier, more predictable, and creating an environment that's very healthy for our implants. So what am I speaking about when we talk <coughs> about a multi-unit abutment? So I've taken this picture here. There have been many iterations of multi-unit abutments over the years. And this is perhaps the most modern version of it. This particular case here is the Strauman brand. And you get multi-unit abutments. So remember, this is the piece that goes on top of our dental implant, on top of which our crown can go. All right? So it's that intermediate layer in our stack. It is the component that is used when we say that a restoration was done at abutment level, as opposed to implant level. It can come in straight, as we see here, and at various angulations, and the most common angulations being 70 and 30 degrees. All right. You can go all the way to 45 degrees, and you even get some customized designs for individual cases that go all the way to about a 50 degree. What are the components of a multi-unit abutment? If we have a straight multi-unit abutment, it's a solid piece of titanium. It's got the screw threads that go into our dental implant. The connecting part that joins the internal connection of the, of the implant or goes over the external connection. It's got a little cone shape on the top that fits within our restoration. And then our little well with screw threads that actually holds our little uh, retentive screw or restorative screw. And we'll see that in a bit more detail. The design changes a little bit when we have an angle integrated. Because if we have an angled abutment, we cannot rotate it to get it to screw into our dental implant. So in that case, the screw that holds the multi-unit abutment into the dental implant rotates freely within it. So we then have a screw that holds it in, the actual multi-unit that engages the connection of the implant, and the angulated head, which will hold our restoration with the restorative screw channel within it. Why is a multi-unit abutment called a multi-unit abutment? I still don't know. I thought it was maybe because multi-unit abutments are used for multi-units of teeth. All right. But then when I see this picture, I think that, is it because the abutment has multiple pieces within it? All right. Either which way, it's remember, these are multi-unit abutments. There's been an, illusion, an evolution of multi-unit abutments over time. And the first time they were used was right back when the very first dental implants were done. Professor P.I. Brunemark, who developed dental implantology, um, created an abutment. And it was a very, very complicated uh, component at the time. 
So this is the dental implant that goes into the bone. We know that it had a hexagon on the top of it. So this is a, if we had to look at the implant from above, he used a cover screw. But when they put in these abutments, which was the ancestor of modern multi-unit abutments, there was a cylinder that went on top of our hex, a screw that went on top of that, a cylinder on top of that, and the retentive screw thereafter, okay? So this is the very, very first dental implants. They already saw there was a need and a benefit in moving our restoration a little bit away from our dental implant and higher up to the surface of our mucosa. So then this complicated but here, they took it all and they joined them together, made it a bit more compact, made it a little bit more streamlined. And that became something that is more similar looking to the current multi-unit abutments that we did. In this example here, I've put a straight one in. So it was basically simplified. And as time went, there was a need to start angulating it. Not only changing the angulation of it, but also changing the height. So our multi-unit abutment had evolved from that complex component to something that was simplified, now with angulations and different cuff heights. The height of the metal that we see there, we call the cuff height. Because in order to determine the height of what we're going to use here, we would need to know the cuff height of mucosa that sat above our implant platform. And then it evolved further. They got iodized, changed colors, some are pink, some are gold. They say that gold looks a little bit more pleasant in the mouth if a little bit of the metal shows through. And then the angulation started to improve, implants changed. Having a multi-unit abutment prevents us from having to get down to here whenever the prosthesis is removed or an impression done or some step done in the fabrication of the prosthesis. The other advantage is to correct angles whether the angu angulation was by design or it happened to be because of complications during surgery, having multi-unit abutments and having angles at our disposal allows us to choose a straight abutment where the implant is straight and choose the correct angulation if the implant is angled so that our restorative channel or path of insertion is then parallel on all implants. This lends itself to passivity, all right? So it's starting to tie in over here. So passivity is a thing that is really hard to achieve in dentistry, but it is critical to the success of our restoration from a biological and a restorative point of view. Multi-unit abutments give us a get out of jail free card to correct angulation and increase our chance of passivity. We're also able to do more implants quicker. What do I mean by that? In an area like here, where the mental foramina are in an area where we would like our implants to emerge, having multi-unit abutments at our disposal allows us to deliberately angle our implant so that we avoid anatomical structures and emerge where we would like to emerge, but still correct the angulation of the implant. All right, so angle correction is very important. And even our heights can be modified. So similar to the example that you guys saw earlier, sometimes implants are placed a little bit deeper, but the mucosal level would be the same throughout. So having abutments of different heights allows us to go from our implant level, no matter how deep it might be, to get the restorative platform higher, couple that with an angulation correction, and we're killing two birds with one stone. All right. Passivity, having multi-unit abutments, allowing us to get parallelism and a restorative platform that is on a similar plane, lends itself to passivity, all right? So we said passivity is desired, passivity is hard to achieve, and having a passive restoration or as close to passive as possible reduces the chances of mechanical and biological complications. So in an example like this where there are multiple implants that are joined together, having brought our implants to a similar level and having corrected the angulation so that everything is relatively parallel, we're able to achieve a closer to passive impression and then a closer to act, uh, passive um, restoration. Patient comfort. 
In the process of doing multi-unit or full arch implant restorations, there is the need during the fabrication and treatment process to remove the prosthesis many times. And if we had restored a patient at implant level, that means without a multi-unit, every time that that restoration is removed, we would have to go deep down into the mucosa. It is more painful. The chance and the need for local anesthetic is more. If the patient didn't want local anesthetic, it's that visit where you're going to tell them, listen, it's going to be painful. It makes for an unpleasant experience. Besides that, this, these are implants without multi-units on them. Besides that, that irritation and that breakage in what is called hemidesmosomal contacts down there introduces bacteria, brings about inflammation, all right? Leads to bleeding, which also plays a role in, in inaccuracy of impression. Yet, sorry, yet if we had multi-unit abutments, we're able to get the restorative platform quite high up. We're able to remove and replace the restoration without causing discomfort, inflammation, without reintroducing pathogens down to the implant level. And so it makes for a more pleasant experience and a more stable biology. We, I mentioned it a little bit er earlier, but the use of multi-unit abutments and the ability to correct angulation makes it possible to do more treatment quicker. All right? And this is, this is perhaps the biggest reason that I personally use multi-units is because where we have a pneumatized sinus with residual ridge resorption and we would d wish to give the patient a full set of teeth on dental implants, if we could not correct this angle or reduce that steep angle, the implant would have to be placed straight in this area here. But we've got a large sinus. It would mean a sinus lift. It means longer treatment time, more risk of complication, more surgery, higher morbidity. But being able to angle our implant away from our sinus or away from the mental foramen or inferior alveolar nerve, and then being able to correct the implant angulation, we're able to treat these cases quicker doing less surgery. All right? So that so multi-unit abutments play a role in reducing the need for grafting. And then it saves the day. So this is a case that I had to restore where a patient had implants placed in theater. And what happened here is the surgeon aimed for the pterygoids to try and get the implant in position, but ended up with a very, very, very severe angle, even though this was a subcrestal correct, angulation corrected implant. So the screw axis would have been out here somewhere. So by placing a multi-unit in a opposite direction, we're able to get a screw channel that is then more realistic. So very often where I've got implants that have been placed previously, where the positioning and the emergence of the implant is completely unrestorable. If there is sufficient mucosal thickness for us to place a multi-unit abutment, or it's at the back of the mouth where a little bit of metal uh, is not a major problem if seen, a multi-unit abutment makes an unrestorable implant restorable. So how is it used? Let's ask first, when? Multi-unit abutments can be placed either at the time of surgery, or the implants can be placed and covered up and the multi-units then placed at exposure after integration of the implants. So if we look at these two pictures here, this is multi-unit abutments being placed. These things here are the carriers for multi-units. They're just little handles that are used temporarily. Can be placed at surgery, or we can wait for the implants to integrate, expose them or take off the um, healing caps and then place multi-unit abutments on here. Which one is better? Um, Placing them at surgery has the variability of you will not know for sure where the soft tissue will end, all right? So there's a little bit of risk involved in there. But you're, if you get it right, you never need to go down to the implant ever again. There is the chance of having some bony integration of your multi-unit abutments. To place it after means that you've got a little bit more knowledge on where the soft tissue is going to end. But it means that you are subjecting that patient to another surgery. You are placing a multi-unit and going down to implant level again. All right? But it can be placed at either of those two 
uh, times. So this is an example of both. So this is a study that we'll look at later where they took several cases and they placed in dental implants. On some of the dental implants, a multi-unit was placed at surgery and then a protective cap put on the, on the multi-unit. And on others, the healing caps were placed and a multi-unit later on. It was done on the same patient, so the um, host variables are all the same. Uh, in this particular study, they found that on the patient where a multi-unit was placed at the time of surgery, when they compared it to where on the implants where the multi-units were placed later on after integration, the level of bone preservation was much better on the multi-units placed at surgery, where you never had to go down to the level again. All right, so that's some food for thought there. So choosing a multi-unit, whether after integration or whether at surgery uh, can be a little bit complicated. We need to get the correct height and the correct angulation. One way would be to have many multi-units available to you, open them in and try it. But that's a costly thing. Uh, it's what do you do if you've chosen the wrong multi-unit. So it is for that reason that various implant systems have this blurry image here. This is a, a kit um, on, of a try-in of multi-unit abutments. So they are replicas of multi-units that can be sterilized, that have every height combination and every angle combination. So that allows you to try them in, decide which one you want, and then open the abutment that you would want to place. This is an example of another company's uh, try-in kit. It's based, you can see the different uh, la laser lines here show us what the height would be. And then we have our various angulations. It's probably straight 17 and 30 degrees. So using this, we would determine cut and restorative angulation. So if we look at our prosthetic flow chart, like Strauman has, I see some at the back here. This is for the BLX system. Um, this is something that we will we always refer to when looking to order components. Uh, whether for doing single restorations or multi-units. We, when we're talking about multi-unit abutments, we're down here. Our actual multi-units and the entire range that is available to us, that's 0, 17, and 30 degrees in angulation, but heights of 0 0.75 all the way to 5.5 millimeters. These are determined by our try-in kit, all right? And we would use these abutments. We can then place pr uh, protective caps on top of those implants when we are either waiting for an immediate restoration to be fabricated or while waiting for integration to happen. And then there's titanium temporary cylinders that fit on top of that. The definitive restorative solution there is called a vario-base abutment. You get impression copings here again, closed tray and open tray. You get analogs as we must to convey to the laboratory the implant position. You get burnout copings for fully castable restorations, lab screws and definitive occlusal screws. There are scan bodies and multi-unit abutments so that we can scan and do impressions. So the entire range is available for any system that you would want. So if we go in a little bit closer, that's to give you a, uh, a better view of the entire range that fits on top of these multi-units once they have put in place. So these components here only work once this has been placed onto the implant. And that is placed either at implant placement or after integration, all right? Notice how analogs are different. This is what we saw, the 3D printed model, which can take a particular analog, that's the repositioning analog for digital impressions, versus the analog analog for our normal putty impressions. This is a tiny screw. This is the screw that holds our restoration on top of the multi-unit abutment. One of the most common questions I get is, is the screw strong enough to hold a restoration? Especially seeing as our restoration is not just a single crown. The answer is, it depends on passivity. 